Hello, you've got Ted Corliss with the Corliss Law Group and Marcus Castillo, trial consultant and lawyer. I am thrilled to have Marcus in the studio. Gosh, Marcus, how long has it been since we've done a podcast together? Uh, it's probably been five years at least now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're so happy to have your attention today. And we want to share with you some very recent stories about some cases that we've tried. Marcus and I are both trial attorneys. How many years have you been a trial attorney? Uh, for the past nearly 40 years. Wow. And I'm heading on to 30 here very quickly. Yes. Things are different these days. They really, yeah. really are. Um, we want to talk about some very recent experiences. We want to talk about some lessons that we've learned that uh, might even have application outside of the courtroom, we hope. We also want to talk about just some bizarre things that are happening in the legal community, which I associate with the pandemic a lot. Do you, do you think that there's an effect there? Of course, because of our separation from each other. You know, we're just coming back now, but we've been separated for two years yeah. from each other. So we're going to introduce ourselves to those that don't know us. So I grew up here in the St. Petersburg area. I raised a family here. Um, I have two boys, now grown men. In 2013, my first wife, Linda, passed away. I met my wife, Jennifer, in Auburn, Alabama, where my one of my kids was going to college. And uh, we long distance dated and married over five years ago. And I now live on a farm in Georgia, which is sort of a shrine to my wife's uh, chef reputation mm, there. Yes. We, she has a commercial kitchen. She's a, I call her a minor celebrity chef. Um, hmm. And we have a little personal theme park there called The Farm. And I've seen pictures and it's crazy. So tell, how many different worlds do you have at The Farm? I think it's five <laughs> yeah. with different mascots, if you will. It's uh, under you know, construction still. But yes, this is a place where you can come for a culinary experience and then tour our personal theme park. Because you, you have like a giant tree house, right? We do. We have, okay. The, okay, so yeah, you, come in, you come in and the first land you go to is called the Three Sisters. It's a, at a bend in this creek and there's a waterfall there. Gotcha. And uh, she has, we're in the process of putting up artwork on the uh, trees. She has, but the, the bit, most important feature is her cottage she has there, which is like a enchanted cottage. She has this light show thing projected on the Cool. It's really cool. <laughs> right. Yeah. So then you go down this, you do know that magic mushrooms are still illegal in the state of Georgia, right? <laughs> you know that. all kinds of wildlife and wild things. Like that there. <laughs> right. So you go over a bridge that she got me for a, a birthday present. I you got a bridge birthday. for a birthday I've present. I got a bridge for a birthday wow. present. It's called the Monkey Paw Bridge. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Grandparent okay. name. Anyway, so up the hill you go to the treehouse. Now, the deal with the treehouse is this is a shrine to what was my wife's bed and breakfast in Barnesville, Georgia, which was famously haunted. In fact, the last episode of Ghost Hunters on CBS was devoted to the- Oh, I've got to the see The rumble that. seat. Okay, okay. And, and so we have a sign there and it's like, you know, dedicated to the thing, but the whole idea is was ha famously haunted. So we have skeleton structures all around the place. <laughs> all right. And so then you go down past the treehouse to down the rumble seat trail where there are more skeletons you will encounter till you get to the creek where it's called the crossing. And on one side, you have skeletons waving to the other side. On the other side are aliens waving back because once you cross the creek, you're into this new land called the far side. We have oh, so, aliens yes. on Good. that side. All right. All right. So you encounter them. And then the last of these lands is called the crack of dawn, which okay. is like a canyon. It's, it's really spectacular, actually. Wow. It's beautiful within the second waterfall. Well, because that whole area of Georgia, it's isn't it kind of an old mountain range? It's like a Piedmont type of area right where it's at, but to the south, there's a mountain range. There's actually Good. mountain ranges in both directions. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So anyway, right. I live with my wife, Jenny, there. Got it. Except when you, I, don't want, I force you to come down here and try <laughs> cases with me, which we've we've now. This is my home. Florida is my home. I would say Georgia is my home, too. So I have two homes. Right. Well, I, I guess the way my wife and I answer the whole thing about where we are when we're not here in Tampa is we, we work in Tampa, but we live in Colorado. Right. And so my my share on you know where i am is that i am uh just turned 55 double nickel here after headed towards 28 years as a licensed attorney started out in the state of missouri working for the biggest nastiest law firms i could find you know representing evil companies and 
terrible people and got lots of opportunities to do that, which we'll talk a little bit about here in a bit. But through the years, my wife and I and our daughter, Thea, who's 13, lives in Tampa. But when and as fast as we can after she gets out of school, we head to Boulder, Colorado. In 2018, we bought a home up there that was it's an extraordinary place. It really is. I've been offered double what I paid for it. And I laugh at people but because it's, it's we're in Boulder City, unincorporated, but we're on 30 acres. And the a house is a mile from one of the biggest intersections in Boulder, but we're 1,200 feet up. Yeah. And so if Denver gets eight inches of snow and Boulder gets 12, we get 18. And our driveway's a half mile long, and you just, I just love it. The snow just pounds. In fact, it snowed yesterday. And I, I, I got so many pictures from my friends up in Colorado. So. Do you have wildlife? We have got every critter because... What's happening here is our house butts up against the Roosevelt National Forest and the Roosevelt National Forest butts up to Estes Park and Rocky Mountain National Park. Right. So there's a whole bunch of migratory stuff, you know, during different times of the year that will go up and down. Like we have these little guys called marmots. They're like beavers. Right? They look just like if you watch the movie Groundhog Day, right. there's the scene where Bill Murray is driving and the groundhog is actually driving the truck that's what they look like. And they got these little heads and these big bodies and they make this very loud chirping sound that sounds like a bird. But now we have a, a Bernese mountain dog uh, just right. crested a hundred pounds. And we don't see as many of those little marmots as we used to, but we also see deer every day. We have a, a herd of deer. There's about a dozen of them at different times and they go up and down our property they, in the morning and in the evening. And then every day at 10 o'clock, and at four o'clock, we are visited by a family of eagles. And you know that because they will circle our house and the mountain that we're on and literally they'll call to each other. So you have like the once we had the mama and two chicks and she was sh taking them all around the property, showing them where they were hunting. And it's just you just stand up and watch all this. So we've had bears come up right up on the deck. Uh, one bear got up and started drinking my wife's coffee at like 1030 <laughs> in the morning. Yeah. And uh, then we had a mama bear with a cub. And so we had to kind of create a protocol that if we're near the house and we observe a bear that we all rush the house and then we lock all the doors because it's a bear, you know, and they're not cute. Yeah. So so that's that's where we love to be. You know, when we're not when I'm not working, we're up in Colorado. So we share a lifestyle of going between states. Isn't that maybe because you have to have that in order? You know, you and I talked about this most recent dis case we tried together right. up in Dade City. And we, we, we beforehand, we talked about the depression you go through after you go through a trial, win, lose or draw that yeah. it's I think it's I associate it with the fact that you are literally in a state of fight and flight for weeks. And yeah. it's just like when you are wound that tight for that amount of time and the preparation I know you put into your trials and I know the preparation that I put into mine. And it's, you know, I always tell people when I was a young lawyer working at a large firm in Kansas City, there was a point where I was working on one of my first trials and I'd been at the firm for weeks at most. And I was looking around the room and I, I don't know why I noticed this, but I noticed every single person in the room was either late thirties or early forties. And these were the senior guys who were on the front lines. And then when I was at Shook Hardy, where there was all the big tobacco people around, most of the lawyers that were trying their cases were like 38 years old. And I kept like, where are all the old lawyers? And they're like, well, they're either dead or they learned better that they they feel like they climbed their mountain. Let's talk about our trial philosophy too, because I okay. think you and I yeah. agree that a fewer, bigger model yes. is a better way to live, right? It absolutely is. I mean, about the better way to live. I will say this though, two of the trials I've had in the last 18 months took a lot out of me. And it takes me longer to get back up and do it again. But I think it's this idea though that I'm not going to get involved in a case that I wouldn't take to trial. Okay. So let's talk for a minute and, and, and acknowledge that we need rest periods because we're talking about how you said it's like a depression. It's definitely it's a, a death. It's if, a body yeah. crashing that lasts for at least a right. week after a trial. 
and and three weeks is not unusual. Yeah, like oh, you yeah, just yeah, yeah, like yeah, you, yeah. your sleep is affected. Exactly. You're the I lose. I think the case we just tried. I'm I'm okay to say the name of it. Why? Yeah, Who yeah, cares? Bingham. It was public. The Bingham case. I lost four pounds right. in in four days. Yeah. So. And it's just a, a time of recovery. You have to build it in. And then I got COVID right after it. Right. Me. So I got another three weeks of rest after that. Well, at least you did it in the right order. I yeah. Did. Because I, I had some problems here at the firm because I had a couple of employees that wouldn't get vaccinated. And I kept saying to them, if you get sick during the trial, you're unavailable to me. And this is not the kind of business where people can just substitute. It, it's not with it's not and you i take great effort to prepare that's success in this business for me tell me what how you feel about this it's preparation oh that, absolutely. It's, that, that's if you go to trial and you see me okay. be effective it's because of the amount of time that went in behind that uh, and yeah. now that is a great segue into whiteboarding and let me just right. talk about ted and brag on Ted. even that. <laughs> whiteboarding is what, my life yeah yeah that's the first thing I noticed about his approach is that he has a massive whiteboard and we have had the um, I've had the privilege to whiteboard out a couple little Sistine chapels of thought. Absolutely. Out well there. said. I mean, we had at one point and any competent lawyer would do this. So this is not some huge trade secret. We I mean, we mapped out the elements of the case we'd have to prove. So the whole judge trial we were going to have to do. But then thematically, what's like the theme and. You know what's our story here so you had all of that though you can and you filled use. the board with it you right. did and the, the the board is i don't know how long it is but but it's all basically to the from the floor to the ceiling right. and i have ladders and you kind of go up your ladder yeah. and get a whiteboard <laughs> really? really you know there are so many things you need to be doing and like for instance, Keith Mitnick and all of what he, his books talk about is you've got to really engage in this mental chess game where you think through, it's like starting at the DV level that, hey, here are the elements and we have to just have a counter to every single thing and think it through. And so the whiteboard's great for that. You right. Mean, hey, different right. color ink, right? You know? Oh, I have, oh, I, I have a box of pens that are erasable pens that somebody went crazy and bought like four gross of blue erasable pens and i have i literally have like 600 and so i i i'm teaching this whole process to my teenager the when she prepares for exams or what we would do when we do math problems because i had the same whiteboards i have two of them at home one's in a, a what we call the lab which right. is where my daughters had a lot of reptiles and things like that now my wife's using it kind of as an office. Uh, but then there's also one in the other bedroom because I was encouraging her to just go crazy and start writing on right. this board. So now fast forward, I'm in Colorado when I was getting ready for the Bingham trial and I needed, I needed that, but I don't, for as crazy cool and as big as the house is, I've not really found a place that makes sense for me to put a whiteboard yet. <laughs> Well, so I went to the local art store and I got the biggest paper that I could find. And I think I got a pad that had like, it's like 72 inches by 60 inches or something like that. Right. And I would lay these out in the hallway of my home yes. and, and I would write topics on the top of them. And then I would walk up and down the hallway and I would, I, oh, this goes on board five. And I would go in there and I'd write on that. And then when I sat down to do my writing, then I'm, I literally have the boards stacked next to me. And I just this is pull like them out. Six days of creation. It's right. like you're manifesting <laughs> your entire I didn't want to lose. On that. Absolutely. I didn't want to lose anything. Yeah. You know, and I now if I went back and looked at those, my former law partner, Morgan Barfield, right. would see me do this. And he, it was like a couple of times. You're like the beautiful mind guy. You know, like you got but string attached to each one of the ideas. and It's absolutely what you have to do, though, in, pre in preparation for trial yeah. is the whiteboarding and just the... Well, you know, I, 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 I like to talk about the idea that when you are presenting to a jury, yeah, the idea is that you want to teach them on every level, uh, meaning that some people learn by hearing things some people learn by seeing them and some people learn by writing them and so i would we would give a jury steno pads 
with pens and then I would tell them what our theme is or our theory or what the evidence is. Then I would write it somewhere so they see me, they see it, they hear it, and now they write it in their, so I'm hitting on all of those levels. And that kind of repetition really, so I think part of what I'm doing too is by writing it on the board, I now have both a visual memory of it but also I'm almost speaking to myself and the writing process. Right. And it, I think it gives you control over the record that I don't think you can learn by just reading depositions. I think it is that because you can tell like the guy on the other side in the Bingham case, and it seems like a nice guy, but he was wildly unprepared right. and I don't blame him for that. Uh, I, I don't know, obviously, but I think he did not know the evidence of this case. He, he just had no control over it. And the case, of course, ended in a very strange way. Yeah, should, and uh, yeah, yeah, so should surprise us all. Yeah, just the executive version of that. I don't know. It, is This is a case, it was a bad faith case against uh, Tower Hill Insurance Group. Uh, well, I should say it wasn't against Tower Hill Insurance Group. There instead was the company that we sued was Tower Hill Preferred Insurance Company. Although to date, we have never been told that Tower Hill Preferred has any employees or ever has. Uh, certainly there weren't any employees in this case. So this was a case where we had evidence that Tower Hill, in very simple terms, had a stack of claims where they knew they owed. In fact, even though they were in a lawsuit, they knew that they owed more than what they had previously paid. And instead of sitting down and adjusting those claims, Tower Hill turned the cases over to a quote litigation manager and they adjusted those claims in the litigation and they used the machinations of litigation to reduce their claims payments, which I believe legally, my experience, 27 years is unethical and frankly, contrary to Florida law. And so we demonstrated that in our client's claim easily. Uh, they spent four years fighting her on the claim that they ultimately- We're talking about the underlying contract. Right, case. so she has a sinkhole case involving a duplex. And the when she filed the claim, she told the insurance company that the guy who owned the other side of the duplex had seen damage to the property and had notified his insurance company. Well, they hired an engineering firm that comes out and says, hey, this is sinkhole. So she tells them that literally, and we, we played for the jury the recording, right? <laughs> Where she explains all this. Well, from the date she had that conversation on November 10th, 2010, to the date they paid her was four years. And th along the way, we see them admitting that they, they got sued and they were angry. This because this is really what Tower Hill, uh, all of them, they're pissed because we were wrong. We shouldn't have denied the claim, I guess. But when they got sued, they were like, well, why didn't you just bring the report to us and tell us that there was sinkhole there? We're like, well, did you hear the recording? Uh, now, now, all along, she's living in the sinkhole house right? for four years. Right. For four years with a, her ex-husband was living there because he was very ill in a wheelchair uh, with congestive heart failure. And he lived until about, I think, two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, Richard. And by the way, everything we're talking about here was presented in an opening statement. It's public record. It's totally public record. And if if Tower Hill disagrees with anything that I'm saying, then I, you got my email address. You email me and I'll publish anything you want. If, if you want to send me a 500 page dissertation as to why what you did was ethical and legal, then I would say to you, you send it to me and I'll publish it without editing it. So if I say something here, because here's the other good news, uh, we're going to be publishing the record of that trial. And I encourage you listening to this podcast to like or subscribe so that you'll get to hear because what we're going to do is we're going to bring the record in and we're going to read it to you because the court wouldn't let us record in the courtroom. The only thing she would let me record was my opening. And the point here is the judge decided that even though they admitted to doing this to dozens of other insureds, she didn't feel she saw evidence of a general business plan that would allow our bad face suit to proceed. 
Now, so this is under review in the second DCA. That's that right. right. We already have a pending appeal, and it's not affected by these kinds of publications because the appellate court's answer to this question will simply be, the question really they're going to ask is, did Mrs. Bingham, through counsel, put on evidence that there was a frequency of behavior that constituted a general business practice? Now, the judge in her finding it, and I'm, I believe the record's going to show she doesn't actually say that. What Judge Barthel says is general business plan. So there's a real question here as to whether or not the court even made a decision on the right element, because she said, I didn't see business of a, evidence of a plan, and I didn't see that you had specific intent to Mrs. Bingham. Now, the absurdity of that, respectfully, is that. We showed emails, inter-office emails, where they were talking about not paying Mrs. Bingham the money that they owed her. Right. And we had those in the record. Uh, truthfully, I think the real thing where we, we, the two boats passing in the night with the judge had less to do with the reality was the strongest evidence that we were going to put in front of this jury had not been published to them yet. All right. Well, let me. Okay. okay so you take, pick wanted, up there. I want to talk up there. about the presentation of that case and talk about. The trial technology we use, specifically TrialPad. Fantastic. Yeah. T let's talk about TrialPad. Yeah. And for those of yeah. you that, that don't know what TrialPad is, it's an iPad app that I think is on par to sanction and other much more expensive laptop-based products. Yeah. And uh, Ted used it in the Bingham trial. I thought the great advantage. Uh, I, oh, I learned a couple of things. Oh, my. Remember how I didn't understand that? I plugged it into the monitor and I didn't plug it into the power. And I'm about to do my second half of the cross examination of the corporate representative. Right. And I was on 7% uh, on my iPad. That's anyway, right. so go ahead, trial pad. Well, yeah. talk about using it um, in opening. I mean, yeah. How did it benefit that? I, I think it was just uh, the cool thing about trial pad is it's, it's like the porridge. You know, it's got enough functionality, but not too much. Because that's the problem with uh, some of those other applications. Um, the only thing I guess that's a little strange is that because it's trial pad, the only device you can use it on is an iPad. Yeah. Now, the one thing I wish they would work on is video presentation, like video depositions. I don't think they have that functionality yet. And I think I've seen literature to the effect of they're working on it. They, they've got a, a, it's a real ham handed approach to it now, if you right. want to use, because you can even pull in, it says video and like you can pull in a PowerPoint. But when I was trying to marry up the applications, because we had a PowerPoint, right? Uh, we were PowerPointing some of the images of the because this is, a, I know we're jumping around, but no, just good. so you understand. No, but we were able to establish that the insurance company's position was, well, there was a sinkhole confirmed at the duplex, but our experts said there wasn't. And that was enough for them to deny the claim. But we at least asked them, shouldn't you have gotten a copy of the report from the other engineering firm? And the answers we got were kind of all over the place. My favorite was the claims adjustment supervisor, Karen, actually testified that our claims adjuster should have gotten a copy of that report right, after right. Mrs. Bingham told her that there was a report, which, by the way, if they had been properly trained, they would have known that the report was available three, three clicks through Google. It's a public record if a sinkhole is confirmed there. You could it literally would have taken 42 seconds. But what we pointed out to the jury was what Tower Hill was doing was they spent more time investigating Mrs. Bingham than they did investigating the house because they could have done a, a search online to find out if there was confirmed sinkhole at that property. But instead, they were doing searches using different applications to see if she had any prior bankruptcies. They were looking to see how many claims she'd ever made on auto policies, how any of that related to whether or not there was direct physical loss to her like structure. Post claim underwriting. Absolutely. That's absolutely what that was. And so even though in that case, the claims adjuster who worked for an independent firm was aware that the property had been confirmed, even though the claims supervisor knew it, who actually did work for Tower Hill Insurance Group, and even though the vice president of claims were completely aware, nobody even stopped to say, you know, maybe we ought to find out the truth or veracity of this claim that the building has been confirmed. 
And of course, everybody was like, no, we had an engineer that said no. So we just denied the claim. But then when you sued us, you should have called us and asked us, hey, did you guys review yeah. the file or did you actually go get a copy of the report? I mean, we didn't know what was in your file. And so they sent us a letter after they got sued, said, all right, we owe. We're, we're reversing the claim. So the, the importance of that is at that point, adjust the loss. But they didn't do that. It took them two and a half years from the time they did that, because what they did was they went after they testified to this. Um, I think his name was Sam Townsend, very clearly, very defensively said the reason they were pursuing that strategy was to push back on the plaintiff's lawyers. Well, let me stop for a moment. Which isn't the, that kind of relevant to what we're talking right. about? Well, let yeah. me talk for a moment about, for those that don't know, what's going on legislatively about possibly limiting remedies. Is that what's I have going a copy right of it. We can get into a little bit more. It's, it's on the list, okay. but I will tell you, I just got the bill that was filed this morning and read it. There's very little about the attorney's fees issue. They add in this this global fear they have of contingency fee multipliers, which I addressed in an earlier podcast. That's no big threat to the current insurance crisis. There, nobody gets in contingency fee multipliers anymore. Anyway. Anyway, they don't. So but if the, it was legislatively extinct, it wouldn't matter because it was right. extinct already. And, and a lot of it is, it's. I told someone the other day, they just passed a law that they're going to shoot the, re, the rest of the unicorns in the state of Florida. Okay, well, find one. Find me an order where a judge gave someone a contingency fee multiplier. And I'll t and I will point out to you. I bet there are facts of that claim you don't know. Yeah. Because yeah. the only time you get those is if, man, you catch an insurance company with their pants down doing really horrible, nasty things, kind of like they were doing to Mrs. Bingham. Yeah. Yeah. So, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the actual trial from a technical standpoint. Yeah. I understand. And, and sure. just talk about some lessons learned and just other thoughts about this recent trial experience. You know. Um, we dealt with a guy who at times was just making, I thought, bullshit objections. Um, he objected, what, seven times during my opening? Right. Right. He was just yeah. obstructive and uh, tried to do uh, trip you up, you know. And I, I guess that's a strategy. I don't think the jury, well, we don't know what the jury thought because the judge took the case away before the jury even got it. She knew better than the jury was going to know. Now, I thought that Ted connected very well with the jury. In fact, I thought I'd connected well with the venire I before so. it got you yeah. know, to the jury point. But it's so amazing to me to just hear her say no reasonable person could do X. As you pointed out, We've had 20 mock jurors, at least, that say 21. no. Yeah. Right. However many it's been. Yeah. I've said, no, 50 million is what we Right. We had jurors. We, I would say the first time we mock tried it, half the jurors came back between 25 and 50 million. Right. The second time we mock tried it, we had all of the jurors come back at 25 to 50 million, which yeah. means they found that there was a frequency, that their, the frequency demonstrated general business practice. And in fact, in this case... They even gave the general business practice a name. And demographically, forget demographics, attitudinally, whether it was conservative or liberal, it was uniform. They all hated Tyrell. Right. You, could, we, you, you had a couple people, as Marcus is great about this, he'll produce a veneer of people to listen to our cases where you have like the big classic Trumpster 70-something men who, I mean, wow. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. There's no way to describe how confrontational these guys are. And they were all like, yeah, uh, you've got young people between the ages of like, we had a couple of jurors in their young 20s, and then you had people in their 50s. And, and everybody was like, what was this insurance company doing to Mrs. Bingham? This is ridiculous. And that's why we felt like, and I told this to the corporate rep after the court threw the case out. I said, all right, guys, see you on YouTube. Well, that's where we are right now. And we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce these ideas and then we're going to give you the record and we're, we're going to read the record. We're going to recreate it. It ends up being about two days of testimony and we're going to build this and then you can listen to it and you can tell me whether you believe that a jury would find a verdict in favor of the plaintiff here. And if Tower Hill agrees, then maybe they'll make some some wise choices about where they go from here. But it's time we're not going to take this sitting down and we aren't. There's an appeal pending and all the second district court of appeals has to say is that there was 
evidence in the record that a jury could have relied upon. Yeah. That's it. One thing that really was frustrating about this trial was how we had to fight over what were basic evidence points, right? Yeah. Um, just hearsay stuff that she should have. Well, here's what he would do. Here's a good example. Remember, we had a claim file from another case where they did the three things to this woman that they did in our case. And I mean, identical. And that, that's not a coincidence. So we we admit, try to get that into evidence. And the lawyer would say, oh, well, it's hearsay. And we go, all right, well, it's a business record. You produced it to us. Right. Uh, well, but there's there's hearsay within hearsay. And what we would have to do is because I would say, well, Your Honor, they, they were supposed to object to a lot of this stuff weeks and months ago. That, right. that was the one thing when I say unprepared. They blew deadlines like they were meaningless. They didn't care. That's they a filed. frustrating thing with the It really system. is. Yeah, because is what are you supposed standard. to Well, right, because I, at one point I even said to the judge, I'm just curious. And I don't know. She was really angry at me when I said this. Uh, she, I said, oh, do the rules apply to everybody or just us? That is a frustration I want to put out there, too, that there is this leniency towards people who don't obey these pretrial orders. Right. And then they, they're like, oh, Your Honor, we uh, like... In this case, Tower Hill had the same law firm for three years, right. or two or three years, and then less than a month before discovery closed, they substituted counsel. And first, when we saw the notice of appearance, we thought it was appellate counsel, which is very common. And no, 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 they this they literally substituted a count a, a lawyer who then walks into the court and says. I'm not prepared to proceed. I need more time. And the judge is like, you take the case the way you find it. But then some reason that this was some genius idea over at Tower Hill, they decided that they were going to defend this case by arguing that when Ted Corliss, this is me per specifically, that when Ted Corliss was a defense attorney handling these cases, he did the same thing on behalf of other insurance companies the same way that we're doing it. When we got the note of the subpoenas, because this guy literally served subpoenas on State Farm, who was one of my clients at the time, and five plaintiff's firms that in 2007 to 2010 were supposedly going to come forward and say that we did the same thing. Now, here's the great news about that. The real motion they were looking for, this allegation that Tower Hill uses in these cases that they, they did many, many, many times. We think we counted more than 60 other insureds. If you sued them without giving them a second chance, meaning we denied your claim. And under Florida law, once you deny a claim, the insured is only obligated, they are not obligated to anything because you breached the agreement if you were supposed to pay and you didn't. Well, Tower Hill would, they would get sued and they look down and go, oh, wow, we did, owe, we do owe this. And instead of just resolving the claim, Tower Hill would get angry and okay, they were pretty angry on the stand. I mean, they, they talk about this loud and proud, man. And Sam Townsend and uh, who's the other guy, Tim Ferguson, that were testifying. Those guys were not, def they were completely comfortable with litigating claims. And so we showed, and, and so this lawyer would say, oh, the claim file has a hearsay within hearsay. And you go, okay, where? It's yeah, 20 because, pages long. Show me where in there. And so we take a break and I would go back instead of spending time getting ready. I would review it and then come back and go, there's no hearsay within hearsay here. Where is it? And then the judge would be like, oh, OK, I'll let it in. So, uh, I mean, here's here's the great thing about it. I feel one of the things I feel really good about is that we got to put on their claims rep. He's called a litigation manager by the name of Sam Townsend. And he didn't deny anything as to what as to what was going on here. Absolutely. We accused our insureds of fraud and we had this argument back and forth over whether it really was fraud, even though if you look in the language that they cited in the motion, they certainly use intentional fraud conduct. They tried to argue it was really a concealment theory that you concealed facts from us and then we denied the claim here. It was even though. There was no indication in the record that she personally had a copy of this report that, that she told them about that, oh, well, uh, her, her, she had the same lawyer as the neighbor. So they had it. They just they deliberately ambushed us. That's what they said. 
And so when I address that with Townsend, Townsend's like, well, I don't think she ambushed us. Oh, okay. Well, that's what you're, that's what you <laughs> called her. I mean, that you acute, you, you were the one who was involved in this. And the really funny part was this same guy had like a year earlier said, yeah, we can't accuse this woman of concealment here. I mean, cause I think he seems like a straight guy. seems like an honest guy to me. I just think he works for a company that is mechanical and reflexive. I'm not, I don't know their personal morals or boundaries or whatever, but I will say this, that I think what they did there was reflexive, which means, oh, you sued us. Oh, we now owe. Oh, we're going to accuse you of concealing information. Even though the reality is they wrote the policy. If there was a requirement that you have to give a phone call before you sue them. Now, I will I will say this. Since then, the state of Florida has come up with this new notice requirement that before you can sue anyone, you have to serve a notice on them. My opinion, and then they have 10 days to, to respond to it. My opinion here is I don't think even if that notice requirement had been there, I don't think they would have reversed. I really don't because I, I, there was just no indication that they ever believed that it was wrong for them to know that there was another report out there, not get a copy of it. And then their own expert puts in a letter to them. Hey, the insured says that there is a quote confirmed sinkhole there. Now I stop on the quote confirmed. Do you remember when we had that? Right. One of the little teates in the was I said, Mr. Townsend, it says right here that the neighbor reports that the other side of the duplex owner filed a claim and that the property is a confirmed sinkhole. And he goes, Well, do you notice that there are quotation marks around the word confirmed? I would interpret that as meaning, well, like, you know, confirmed. <laughs> and you're like, okay, but wouldn't you have maybe followed up with the engineering firm? Because even the engineering firm admits they didn't get a copy of the report, even well, though it was publicly available. And this is silly. Let me ask you this. You know, you live in the world of property insurance disputes and bad faith cases. Yeah. Is Tower Hill's conduct the norm? amongst carriers or is this an outlier I mean, you uh, uh, you know uh, my answer to that is there's some really good insurance companies in the state of florida I i'll tell you who i put in that stack um i'm i'm a big fan of state farm and i'll tell you uh, both on inside and outside of that company not, not not nothing I've been told or anything as counsel for them because of the many many years I represented them. I have represented State Farm on auto cases. I I didn't do the auto work, but the property stuff that I did and the third party liability stuff, man, if they ever did anything that was like, why did you do that? It was usually because they were trying too hard to pay the claim, and they would commit to something that they shouldn't have because they were more interested in taking care of their clients, their customers than they were necessarily towards, well, the policy says we can do this. Like in Mrs. Bingham's case, one of their defenses was, well, in the policy, it says we don't have to pay you for that big piece of it until you enter into a contract and do the repairs. Now, in this situation, when they conditioned the money on that, they knew she couldn't get a contract because she lived in a duplex where the other guy had basically moved out. He wasn't even living there. And then the house was in foreclosure. So how was she supposed to get an agreement with this neighbor over a property that was in foreclosure? And in fact, we know that at some point Tower Hill dispensed its counsel to go find the mortgage company who bought the, the paper and see if they would agree to use Mrs. Bingham's coverage, not for the pro just her property, but also for the other property. And if that ever made sense, we were going to address that in closing argument. But again, it's just this idea that you have some insurance companies that are like at their head in their policy. It's like a doctor once told me, don't treat the monitor, treat the patient. And here, nobody's asking you to read a bunch of, oh, well, it says maybe and it should be yes or shall may. Nobody's asking you to change the terms of your policy. But what we are asking you to do is keep the focus on the insured because this is the relationship i'm going to send you money every month there are some insurance companies that i will send money to every month of every year as long as i'm alive okay 
I plan on living for a long time. That means I'm going to be giving a lot of money to an insurance company who at some point in time has to part ways with it. And it means that when X, Y, and Z happens under the policy, you're supposed to pay. Get your head out of the policy and look at your insured. And I think in this case, great example of somebody should have stopped after passage of so much time and said, what are we doing? What is our brand? What is, I say that it reflects that in this case, I don't know about all the others, but in this case, they, they showed themselves to be a less than ethical, less than, uh, they're not interested in my client's best interest. That, that's, yeah, I think the real issue is. Hey, it feels yeah. good to be on the right side of something of this scale. Absolutely, and you know what? Uh, we all get in situations where it's a closer call. This wasn't a close call at all. So I say, I compare the way that I always saw State Farm being very focused on resolution, not on conflict. And I hear, I just, Tower Hill was like, they, they, their first theory failed. Their second theory failed. Then they tried a third theory that didn't last weeks where they accused our client of concealing information when that's not what had happened at all. And there's nothing in the policy that the appellate court would tell them later that requires insurers to give you a phone call or a second chance. Now, again, the laws have changed. And then they even tried a fourth argument where they were going to try and get the mortgage company drawn into the lawsuit because they did not want to pay Mrs. Bingham. I mean, to quote Lincoln LaVarge, their vice president of whatever, we wanted to fix every home. Well, he says that like he's doing that in the best interest of the insured. But what he's not telling you are the next couple of sentences that follow that. We're, we want to fix every house because we don't want to give insureds and their lawyers access to money. That's what this was about. It wasn't about whether they owed Mrs. Bingham. It was about the fact, according to uh, Tim Ferguson, who very, who very, again, all these guys, Tim Ferguson, Sam Townsend told us straight up, you're right. We owed as of June 2013, we knew that we had a covered loss that had been wrongfully denied because we didn't get a copy of a report. We knew that the damages were 125% of the policy limits. And we knew that she very unlikely, if not near impossible, could she ever get a contract for the repairs. But from the moment they knew that until the, when they paid was between June of 2013 and to November of 2014. And then they kept saying their lawyer, uh, stood up and said, well, there's this process in the state of Florida where if you dispute the findings of the insurance company, you can submit it to neutral evaluation and that if you'd done that, they would have agreed to pay the claim. Well, let's unpack that. Um, well, it turns out that Tower Hill, in fact, invoked neutral evaluation in this case, and it took seven months. And once it was over in February of 2013, they had a report from a new, from the neutral evaluator who said this house is damaged by sinkhole activity. This house needs to be fixed in its entirety. You can't fix half a house because Tower Hill was arguing that all they had to do was to fix our clients half of the duplex and the other half of the duplex that was in foreclosure. Well, we're just going to uh, ignore that. Well, ultimately, the neutral said the entire property needs to be fixed and the cost of entire fix of an entire fix is greater than the policy limits. And at that time, the property had been in foreclosure for over a year, maybe two years. And for the insured to be able to catch up, uh, it would no way. I mean, you know, if the guy decided I'm going to pay, I, I don't know. They took his deposition and I will tell you that at least the statements that were made to me about what this guy was going to say if he was called a trial didn't match his deposition. I don't know what that means. You know, maybe maybe they talked to him and he said something else. But what I was told thing. that this neighbor was going to say when I went back and read his depot, I'm like, well, it's not in there. Um, it, it was the whole <laughs> the whole DV was shocking. So the, tell so tell tell us what a DV is. So a if I do verdict, it, I might spit up. Directed verdict is the judge basically dismissing the case on the basis that the elements of the case haven't been proven. But 
the other side was as shocked as we were because they were already, you know, we had been talking about who would, they would be putting it on and what time because they knew it was going to be denied. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So they were, what? Well, I had even uh, taken a moment. I asked for a recess at one point because <coughs> the judge became very hostile to a lot of our evidence. And I, I we went over and had a conversation about trying to settle the case. And uh, they... The lawyer was very, uh, very professional, handled it very well, uh, uh, but we didn't. And uh, but we are not done and uh, far from it. In fact, I'm certain that the record's going to be out here very soon, uh, next couple of days, uh, and we're going to publish it in the and That's what we have to do where we file it with the appellate court. Well, if it's in the appellate court, then you're going to be able to find it on my website. So um, that's when we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. Marcus, so how long yeah. are you going to be in Colorado? What's your schedule like the rest of this year? You know what? I, I'm, I'm going to work every day. And when I'm, I really am. I, I, you're the same way. When we're up there, I do find opportunities to do writing and click case development. And I have a case going to trial. What time in the trial. morning when you're out there? When do you get up? In the <laughs> I'm working on that, man. I'm not a morning person. Yeah. But my, my wife, my poor wife is the one who has to get up with our uh, burner, uh, Bernie's mountain dog. Cause he gets up when the, when the sun comes up and so he are you a to... late night person? Is that your, uh, is that... I think where I am right now is I'm not, I'm not as late as I used to be. And so I'm slowly working on the morning because the Colorado mornings are just so beautiful. And the, where our property is located, the, uh, we get a southern exposure right. so you get this lovely morning sun. And then in the afternoon you're on the terrace and the sun is behind the house. And it's just this lovely breeze. You can just feel the air bouncing down. So, yeah, that's uh, our. I, you have a lovely daughter that loves to she, spend time there, right? She she does. I will give her credit too, though, for the fact that she, you know, thirteen year olds uh, want to be with her friends, right. you know, and so she, her lines friends are, are here, cold, but right, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah, but I'll tell you, she's really into uh, volleyball these days, and so uh, she's going to be doing some clinics at CU Boulder this summer, and I think it's going to cool. be Very cool. What kind of clinics cool. are we talking about? Well, it's all volleyball, but like I guess one, one of the clinics lasts a couple days, and they do everything, you know, the bumping, setting, spiking, serving, and then... Then they have clinics that are one day each. We have a one day where all you do is work on your serve. And I think the kid's got a great serve on her. I, I think she does. And she's got, a, she's tall. Does she play beach volleyball too? Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Her school just built a half a dozen or more volleyball courts, sand volleyball courts. So it's, it's, it's good stuff. So yeah. this, this looks like a nice seam for us. Marcus, I, so excited to continue to talk to you Let's in this it. way and we're going to do that and uh marcus is a fantastic resource for the trial lawyers out there who need support and uh it's very affordable uh to get him involved and he sets up these opportunities both we did two of them on zoom and it worked really really well i give you this if it sounds like advice um it might be and that is do not try a case unless you mocked it first if the case is worth trying it's a case you have to mock trial and we've done it more than once in a case and learned things the second time around we did yeah we did and you have to set it up correctly though it's not something where you just go down to the dmv and grab 12 people and hand them box lunches it's not you, you have because to do a little bit of research is yeah because which is what we do what mock trials are not about is getting a bunch of jurors to tell you how impressed they are with your presentation that's not what you're doing you want to give them the worst case you can and listen to what they say and you will there there's a level of honesty that you get from them that it's it always happens somebody says something and you're like wow i but didn't even the, but the thing that i really enjoy doing though is and it's kind of how I've evolved where I'm at with this trial consulting practice. Right. Where it was initially just conduct a focus group or a mock trial or what have you. And it was just a one off. But now it's no, it is sort of the starting point for a consulting relationship or the continuation of one where right. you just take what you've learned and you address those weak points, right? Right, right. And then it evolves to basically the final stages of doing the 
the mock openings and mock, uh, you know, right. what deers even. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, I want to uh, also end the sentence on the, the Bingham versus Tower Hill case. Uh, keep an eye on our website. Uh, we'll be posting up uh, this content and future content, but I'm going to begin by posting up the third amended complaint that I wrote. And I would invite you to read that. And as we go through the story and we piece this all together for you, you're going to see some great examples of stuff that, frankly, insurance companies shouldn't be doing, in my opinion. And uh, maybe we can all get the message out about that while the appeal is pending. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, I appreciate you coming in. Uh, any website you want to? Yeah, absolutely. You, what website uh, you want to send what, them to? Send them to trialfocus.com. Okay, good. And that's a portal that anything else I do. Fabulous, so. fabulous. And mine is corlisslawgroup.com. You all be safe up there, mask out, and be well. Ted Corliss.